Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Chit Chat. I'm Jeremy Roberts with Rebecca Rison and our special guest today, Dr. Kyle Ellis. Dr. Ellis serves as director for the Center for Student Success and First Year Experience here at the University of Mississippi. In addition to his responsibilities as director, he also serves as the university's retention advisory board chair and holds a faculty title of instructional assistant professor of higher education. He received his bachelor's degree in health and human performance and a master's in education from UT Martin and his PhD in higher education from the University of Mississippi. Welcome to the Chit Chat, Dr. Ellis. Nice to have you here, Dr. Ellis. Thanks, Love to hear more about you and the Center for Student Success and First Year Experience. So if you want to start off and just tell us about the Center for Student Success and First Year Experience and your role as director. Feel free to tell us all about that. Yeah, so the Center for Student Success and the First Year Experience was created in 2013. I was fortunate enough to be named the inaugural director and I've been in that position ever since. I've grown in staff and, and services since 2013. Uh, we currently have uh, 30 professional staff members and graduate assistants, and we have five units. Um, at some institutions, these are separate departments, but here at, at the University of Mississippi, we consider them units that report up through the Center for Student Success. So we have academic advising for most of our freshmen. We have professional advisors that we like to say can address anything, everything freshmen. So College of Liberal Arts freshmen, Applied Sciences, Accountancy, Business, um, engineering students who are freshmen and upperclassmen who are undeclared or we call freshman studies in their major. They all work with our professional advisors here in our center. We also have our first year experience programs. And so that's a lot of program services and probably our most well known is our first year experience course, EDHE 105. And it's called the first year experience, largest class on campus. We usually have about 120 sections each fall and 75% uh, or so of our incoming freshmen choose to take that class. It's a three hour elective class that counts towards most majors. Just a great class that helps students make a successful transition to the university. We also have veteran and military services. And so we try to do everything we can to support, you know, current military, active duty, uh, student veterans. Uh, a lot has been done for them in recent years and just a robust amount of resources from you know, paperwork processing to an SVA chapter on campus to fundraising efforts to a big uh, veteran military gala that we do to help fundraise. So, um, so the university is making tremendous strides in that, that's one specific area. We have academic support programs, which you two may know something about, and uh, really appreciate all your work there. If we can ever get moved into our new center, I think we'll take it up even a higher notch. So everybody's excited about moving into the new space and all the great stuff that can come with it. But I mean, from everything from your courses to your services and various programs, you know, and now, especially with, you know, the, the, the COVID-19, all the stuff we had to do and move online. And I'm asking you guys to, to make videos you know, you know, about tomorrow and you guys are doing it and you're rocking and rolling. So I really appreciate all that because we know our students who are at risk probably had the biggest hurdle navigating this, this in class, in person to online. And so I know some of your services, Adapting those to our online you know, learning environment was, was tremendously helpful to those students. And then finally, we do have freshman retention as well. And it's not a unit we you know, overly publicize because it's a lot of behind the scenes work. And as Jeremy mentioned in my bio, I do chair the Retention Advisory Board. And that's a board that consists of cross-campus professionals that are always, like I say, pulling the retention rope in the same direction. Representatives from housing, institutional research, um, IT, uh, first year experience, uh, Rebecca's on it with academic support programs. And so just a lot of individuals that really want to make sure our first year students have a great experience and successful uh, you know, transition to the institution and then, you know, navigate that path on to returning for the second year. So that's a lot of, of what we do, I guess, within our five units in the Center for Student Success. So talking about retention, could you share some retention efforts that the university has done in the past from where we've started? with the center to where we are now, because last year we had a pretty big number. Yeah, I mean, last year we, we set a record. We were almost at 87% last year, and this year, knock on wood here, um, you know, currently, I know it's only June, but we are over 87% so far right now for freshmen who have a schedule for, for next fall. Um, but, but it wasn't easy. I mean, it didn't happen overnight. Um, just kind of backtrack some. Whenever Dr. Morris Stocks was provost, he looked at the uh, freshman retention number in 2007, and it was about 
And he basically said, you know, we're going to change the culture of retention on our campus. So he formed a, a large group, a, a retention uh, task force, and they made some recommendations. And then it became a smaller group, a retention steering committee. And, and they, you know, did a lot of the day-to-day -day work themselves. And over the years, then it morphed into what we kind of know as a retention advisory board. So a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff that the task force did is now it's just inserted into people's job descriptions. Natural process that we've been doing for years and it's really paying off. So now the retention advisory board can take more of that, you know, that 10,000 foot view. You know, we can look at more policies, resources, things to help move the needle even more. And so far we've done it. You know, as I mentioned, we started out about 78%. We picked the low hanging fruit, got to the low 80s with some things. Uh, now we're consistently in the mid 80s and we're trying to take that next step to the upper 80s. But again, it didn't happen overnight. It's been several years and a lot of people working together to make that happen. Just thinking back, um, you know, when we moved from a, a, a very split advising model for freshmen, when many faculty were the, the primary advisors to a professional advising model where um, almost all freshmen are advised by a professional advisor, whether it's in the Center for Student Success or in their school, a more special program even, that's had a lot to do with it, I think. Um, you know, the big robust first year experience course, when we started putting resources there, uh, started slow. You know, I think they you know, heard of the pilot, they brought it back at five sections. And the next year they got 20 sections. Before we knew it, we had 50 sections. So now we're up to over 120 sections. And having that, that high touch effort um, with these caring professionals all across campus, working with those you know, 20 or so freshmen each semester, that's really paid off. You know, financial aid, you know, we track why students leave and it never fails. You know, financial concerns are one of the primary reasons. And so financial aid, you know, having dedicated people to work with freshmen, we don't just say, oh, good. No, we just say, hey, let me get you to so and so delayed and then give that person a financial student's contact. So we make sure it was the loop. So those are just a couple examples. Again, it wasn't one, you know, just magic button here. Here's, you know, here, here's the easy button, press it, and your retention jumps up 10 points. It, it was a lot of things, you know, coming together, making it happen. And, um, but, but again, as I said, it, did, it didn't happen overnight. It's stuff we've been working on day in and day out for several years now. Okay. So you've been involved in academics for a while now. Can you tell us, you started with a health and human performance as your bachelor's, and then you went into a master's of education, and now you have a PhD in higher education. What has been your academic trajectory look like? Well, you know, part, part of it is, you know, just my own current, you know, view on, on, on pedagogy is that hands-on experience. Mm -hmm. And so for me, thinking about when I was 18 and going to college, I didn't know what I wanted to do. You know, I thought I was going to play basketball and, and go on and do, you know, sports-related stuff. And, you know, I, I couldn't make it as a player, so I thought, well, I'll do athletic training, sports medicine, yay. And then I, I had some hands-on experience with that for a year and realized, okay, no, that's not, not where I see myself. <laughs> Um, but it was that hands-on experience that showed me that. And I thought, well, hey, I can, can teach and coach, you know, I'm in the education field, yet I'm still getting to work with athletes. But then after student teaching, I realized, okay, I can't see myself in the K-12 setting for the next 30, 35 years. And so went ahead and got my master's degree and realized, you know, that, that there's a future in working in higher education. Mm -hmm. And from there, I knew if I wanted to work my way up the career ladder, you know, I had to get that terminal degree. And so looking at opportunities, preferably, you know, I grew up in Tennessee, and so looking at opportunities in the Southeast, um, you know, the University of Mississippi was an excellent opportunity to start as an academic advisor. Um, excellent benefits in that you could take two classes as a staff member for free each semester. So I was able to get my PhD, you know, pretty much paid for. Didn't have very minimal out-of-pocket expenses. So, so that was, uh, you know, a big plus for me. And so from there, I just knew that I was destined to work with, you know, college students. And, you know, the more, um, you know, hands-on experience I got, you know, whether it moved me away, such as athletic training or K-12, or it moved me to, like my master's degree in working with college students. And then my first few years as an academic advisor and just seeing how much they appreciated and how much they wanted my help, knowing that that was, uh, that was my calling. Well, and we know that in addition to your role as director, you've also got a lot of other hats that you wear, including the hat of being a writer. And you've written an awesome book about your experience in higher education called the Tennessee Campus 15 Initiatives to Improve Retention. So we'd love to hear more about your book, you know, why you decided to write it, um, how it helps for readers, um, staff, and faculty to know about the retention initiative. So tell us all about your book. 
Yeah, so It Takes a Campus. Um, it, it came out a few years ago, and it was really, it's not anything I just, you know, woke up one day and said, you know, I'm going to write a book. No, it came out more just because of a need. We, we set a retention record, and at the University of Mississippi, for those you know, who may not be aware, we have, I like to say, almost open enrollment, uh, open admissions, especially for our Mississippians. You, know, you can be admitted on a probationary status if you graduate high school, so there's uh, a lot of things there. We, we have, you know, fairly... As, you know, lower admission standards than, than most of our SEC, you know, Southeastern Conference peers, but yet we're right in the middle with retention rates. You know, we're passing several that have selective admissions and have lotteries to pay, you know, in-state tuition costs. And so uh, people want to know, what are you doing? How are you, you know, achieving these great success rates with, you know, you're, you're in one of the least educated states. You're in one of the most poor economic states in the country. You, you have almost open admissions. How are you outpacing, you know, a lot of your peers? And from emails and phone calls and, and requests to go as consultants or, or people wanting to come to our campus and see what we're doing. I thought, well, you know, why don't I just take a year or so and work on nights and weekends and, and, and put it all together. And, you know, truthfully, and I say this a hundred times, you know, although I'm the one that put pen to paper, it's people all across campus who are making the magic happen. And so if you've had a chance to read the book, you know, I talk about 15 initiatives and all those center for student success oversees, you know, four or five of them, um, others, you know, are, are not underneath our center. I have no direct you know, oversight of anything. I just rely on um, those directors and those leaders to uh, help us in retention. So at the end of each chapter, I interview um, someone who is, is directly, you know, boots on the ground with those different initiatives from housing, from financial aid, from IT. And they talk about their role in retention because that, that's what it's all about. I mean, it's called It Takes a Campus because it does. It, it's not any one person's job, you know, even though I, I'm chair of the retention advisory board, you know, I wrote the book, you know, I lead the efforts, but I'm relying on so many other people, as we say, to help pull that retention rope in the same direction. And so the book just highlights that, you know, it highlights our, how with the story I told earlier, how Dr. Stock said, we're going to change the culture of retention and, and how we went from a, a task force to a steering committee to now our advisory board, how financial aids world had changed, you know, from, from working with freshmen, how, institutional research put new things in place, how we started using more technology like Tableau and we got IT to create us an online retention tool. You know, again, it, it's just because we were all, uh, you know, on board with helping students be successful. We all very much respected Dr. Stocks and, you know, wanted to help him uh, you know, achieve his retention goals. And even though we have a new provost now, you know, Noel Wilkin is very supportive of our work. He tells us all the time we're, we're constantly, uh, he likes the, the boxing reference. He says, we're hitting above our weight class. You know, we're, 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 we're the lightweight fighter, but we're, we're you know, trying to go head-to-head -head with some of the heavyweights, I guess. And, and our numbers speak for themselves. We are. We're, we're, we're right there with, again, the institutions that have way more advantages, way more resources, you know, higher academic criteria to be admitted. And we're right there with them. But, again, it's, it's not just me. It's, it's people all across campus. And that's, that's what I try to highlight with the book. So where can somebody find a copy of your book? Rebecca Rison, she has all the copies. She's bought them out. <laughs> I do really like the academic support chapter. I mean, I'm going to say that. When you interviewed me, that was really, I enjoyed that process. So, yeah. yeah if, somebody, if somebody buys a copy, Rebecca will personally autograph that chapter. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so, no, I mean, it, it's available on Amazon. Okay. Um, Not, Nautilus Publishing published it, so it's available on Nautilus website as well. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, pretty much you know, anywhere you can get as ebook or you can get it as the hard copy. Well, what we'll do is we'll make sure that we include a link to that in the description for this episode so people can get a copy of it and get an autograph and do whatever they need to do. So um, aside from your writing, aside from being a director, another one of your hats is you're a teacher. So you're an instructor, a professor here on campus. How do you juggle between all of those and working with our full-time staff, working with graduate students, because that's primarily who's in higher education, what is your philosophy behind what you're doing? I'm, I'm very fortunate in that I have a great staff, the Center for Student Success, so I know you'll talk to, to, to some directors who say, they're so overworked and they're spending nights and weekends and trying to get caught up. And I'm fortunate, uh, just to be honest with you, you know, the, the people who, who run our advising, who run our academic support, who run our veterans, you know, they're real go-getters and, and they're very much accountable for their areas. And I work with them. I get them what they need. 
We can brainstorm and bounce ideas and talk about resources and how to kind of take our service to the next level, but they're doing their job. And so they don't need me to come in behind them and be sure they're doing everything right. And, and so that to me, it does free up my nights and weekends, you know, so that I'm not having to you know, direct, so to speak, people who are under me. I, I know they're getting it done and we're producing tremendous outcomes. So yes, I'm afforded the opportunity to teach. And so I enjoy that very much. I teach freshmen and graduate students each semester. But now you can ask my wife that a lot of my grading and reading, it's at night. <laughs> a lot of the things I do on the weekend, if I'm trying to do the discussion post and respond to everybody, just spend two or three hours on a Sunday afternoon, you know, that, that's when I do it. And so that's how I manage it, at least from a time perspective. Because um, you know, when I'm in the office, I'm overseeing the center stuff, but, but nights and weekends is when a bulk of the teaching uh, components occur. What I enjoy most is the, just the two different dynamics of the, the populations. You know, working with freshmen, they got you know, kind of one foot in the door. They're just coming, they're arriving, everything is new. Working with the graduate students, they have one foot out the door. Mm -hmm. And so they've experienced college, but now they're getting nervous and, and have all those you know, apprehensions of, oh no, I gotta get a job now. But they wanna get a job in an area I'm passionate about. They wanna get a job in higher education. And so thinking about my thumb on the pulse of what is today, you know, what are today's freshmen telling us? What are they saying? What are they doing? And then helping relay that to the graduate students. Here's what college students are saying. Here's what they're thinking. Here's what they're feeling. Here's what they're going through. So when I work with the graduate students, when you go to these interviews, you know, when you write this cover letter, when you talk about your experience, you know, here's some key topics. Here's some hot button issues. Here's some trends across the country. You know, not only do we see this in the literature and we see it in research, but our own freshmen at the University of Mississippi are telling us and showing us these things. So it really works hand in hand nicely. And that I get to experience and, and, and help guide new freshmen making that transition when everything's bright and shiny and they, you know, want to, you know, just the, something about new freshmen arriving on campus that kind of excites everybody. But then also the graduate students thinking about myself as a graduate student and being nervous about am I going to find a job? What am I going to do? Am I going to, you know, have to move back in with mom and dad with a master's degree? You know, all those things that you can reassure them that it will work out. It always does. It may take some time, but, but while you're here, get as much experience as you can meet as many people as you can, grow that network as wide as you can, gain those experience and skill sets to build that toolbox. And so just, you know, working with my connections through, you know, through our university, through colleagues across the country, through all my work in professional associations, and, uh, you know, just trying to relay that to our grad students and helping them, you know, as they take that next step in their career, and thinking about how exciting it's going to be to have future professionals that, you know, I kind of had my fingerprints on out there helping our students, and hopefully that same philosophy of, you know, students first, and what can we do to help students be successful and be satisfied and persist? You know, that, that, that's very much exciting to me. Yeah. So you talked about a trend that incoming freshmen that you relay to graduate students, what would be a current trend that right now that you've taught, that you've seen from freshmen that you've taught to your graduate students to be aware of? One thing I, I love, and I hope it's not a broken record because you know, you guys know me, you know, I'm always wearing the retention hat. And so when I hear our freshmen in their journals, in class discussion, me and one on one talk about, I'm not sure I can come back because my dad lost his job. I'm just really, really, really homesick and I'm Texas. I'm 12 hours. Maybe I shouldn't be here. Oh, you know, I'm from Mississippi and I was the only one in my high school class to come here. Everybody else just got a job. I went to community college, but. I don't think I can hack it academically. And then you're talking to graduate students. Here's some of the things students are saying that might have a great chance to affect their ability to persist. Whether you work in housing, whether you work in fraternity and sorority life, whether you work in counseling center, financial aid, wherever, you will have a direct impact on students to be successful and ultimately persist. And we know in Mississippi, we want our students especially to persist and graduate because not only are they changing their lives, for the most part, they're changing the trajectory of their entire family. And then I take that very seriously and impressing that upon our graduate students to say, hey, you know, I want you to go out and work wherever in higher ed that you, you find your calling. And if you need to go, you know, back home or to a different state, you want know, to go see the world, great. Especially if you stay around in Mississippi and you have a chance to help our students be successful. And again, no matter the area, no matter the department, you play a critical role in helping our students be successful and ultimately graduate, which in turn help their entire family have a, have a good future. So, you know, just hearing those first-hand voices from freshmen and then relaying those to graduate students, I just I enjoy, again, that kind of closing that loop, freshman to graduate student, and just see the cycle. Yeah. 
And you mentioned family too, which I think is a good point. This is a really huge thing for families to entrust an institution with their child, whether it's an in-state student, out-of-state student. Um, as you know, I've got uh, two kids who I'm very proud of, one of which is going to attend Ole Miss in the fall. And I tell other parents too how proud I am that we have worked in Center for Student Success because I feel like I could entrust my child with anything that she is to help with. So, um, what would you say from the perspective of, you know, students attend college, it's a family effort in a lot of ways, um, whether it's an in-state student, out-of-state student, so what kind of advice do you give? I know you get a lot of advice, a lot of great advice, and have a lot of phone calls, emails. Absolutely. When, uh, when, when orientation runs as normal, and it's not COVID-19 related where we're doing it all via Zoom and, and online and, and everything, I speak at the welcome at, at each orientation session and I, I talk to parents. My, my message is primarily to parents. And I basically say, you know, we see you as a partner. We see you as an ally. We both share the same goal. And that's for your child to be successful at the University of Mississippi. And I mean that because oftentimes, especially freshmen, you know, they're going to contact their parents before anybody else. Now, it, it may be through text <laughs> and, you know, it was, uh, some issue in, in, in housing, some issue with a professor, some issue with parking, something. Something's not going to go right at some point. I tell parents that. It's just not. Just, it's life. And the parents are going to get that call. They're going to get that text. And we want to see the parents again as a partner. We don't want mom and dad to say, oh, honey, you just sit right there and I'll pick up the phone and I'll solve it. I'll let you know what to do in five minutes. No, we want the parents to be familiar with us, be familiar with our resources. And they can say, well, have you talked to your academic advisor? Have you talked to your RA? What steps have you taken? And if they're not sure, they can contact us and ask, hey, my daughter is struggling with fill in the blank. How should we proceed? I'll be happy to talk to the parent about it, but ultimately have the parent encourage her daughter to address the issue. Um, for me, it's just, you know, I, I, I like the saying that I would rather see the issue from the student or even the parent in October versus it go unaddressed and have to wave goodbye to the student in December. Because something we could have addressed in October lingers and it makes the whole situation bad and it just snowballs and the student just says, those are hands, I'm leaving. I can't do it all. This isn't right for me. Whereas had mom just pick the phone or sent the email, we could tell them how to address it. The student could come in, talk to us, talk to you guys, talk to counselor, whomever, anybody on campus. We have such, that's the thing about Ole Miss. It's such a great caring community that wants to help students. But if students don't reach out and ask, or even mom and dad, if they don't know where to ask, you know, I send monthly emails, monthly emails to parents of freshmen. They just talk about important policies and dates and campus resources and just to keep them in the loop. And whether they're, they're 100 miles away or 1,000 miles away, you know, they're sharing the same messages that we're sharing with our students in Oxford. And so I think that's really important to, to, to view parents as partners. You know, it's not the old days where, okay, mom and dad, you dropped your child off at orientation. Don't talk to us until you, you know, come to see their graduation. We don't want that. You know, it's an investment. When my children go to college, I'm not going to do everything for them but I'm going to be sure they're doing it. Right. And so if that means me, you know, reaching out to a resource or, or someone on campus say, Hey, how does my child accomplish fill in the blank? Then if I need to help my child get there, I'll share the information with them, but then I'll make sure they're following up and the, the, the child is doing it and actively taking advantage of it. And so, so yeah, so parents are huge in, in, in that regard. And even in the book, you know, you mentioned that, uh, you know, one of the initiatives is, you know, parent involvement and seeing, seeing parents as allies and partners and, working with them to help their, their child graduate. And talking about students, with the Center for Student Success, we work with students who are doing well in college. We work with students who are on probation and then students who would unfortunately go on suspension or dismissal. Looking at those different groups, if you had to have some advice to give out to students, you had every student who was doing well in the room and you could tell them something and then every student who was on probation which you teach one of the probation courses what are some things you tell students to help them get through an issue they may have or a problem or some advice i, I know this sounds so simple but whenever i speak at the uh, the parent panel at the end of orientation day one um my best piece of advice is just Use your resources. Mm -hmm. and, and again, I know that's so simple and, and it's not anything earth shattering, but I mean, the university employs you know, a couple thousand staff members to help students. I mean, that's what they're there for from, 
you know, from our academic advisors to people on your staff to, to housing staff to counseling staff to financial aid. I mean, did any issue, any barrier possible, there is somebody on the campus that can help the student with that. You know, if the student chooses not to go or, you know, if they don't know where to go, but they're afraid to ask an EDHE instructor or ask an academic advisor where to go, it needs to be addressed. And so, you know, I tell parents, encourage your students to use all the resources possible. Um, you know, thinking about students who are doing well, great, rock and roll. They're doing well in the classroom. That doesn't mean they're going to persist, though. They could have so many other things going on, you know, whether it's, it's roommate issues, whether it's health issues, whether it's financial issues, whether it's social issues. I mean, I, we don't know. We know a quarter of their midterm grades are doing well, so you can't just say, you know, okay, good job. Keep up the good work. We're definitely going to see you back next semester because, again, most of our students don't leave because of academics. They leave because of other things. Right. So as you're working with these students who are doing well, congratulate them. It's important to offer that positive feedback. Congratulate them doing well, but then also kind of, you know, get to know them. Understand if there's any other issues that could affect persistence. And then if so, address them. Don't, don't just, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. You know, no, I mean, work with them to figure it out. And then, of course, as you mentioned, uh, on probation, yeah, you got to kind of address the academic issues where they will. Right not be allowed to return due to academic standing. And so that's where, you know, you, you got to just, Rebecca taking a different you know, initiatives in the past where we've looked at each student with low midterm grades and then trying to dissect it. You know, if you're doing well in psychology, let's talk about why psychology is going so well and let's understand the why math or writing or biology is not. What are we doing that's working? What are we not doing? And then if it's not, are you using the writing center? Well, let me show you how to make an appointment to the writing center. Are you going to supplemental instruction? Let me show you where to find a supplemental instruction schedule. Um, you know, and just thinking about that, that, you know, address the immediate issue for them, which is academics, but also, you know, there's probably underlying issues as well going on there. And, you know, you may not be able to, to dive in and hit every one of those, but at least the immediate, because you can see that that's low midterm grades, obviously, or, or low grade on a test or whatever the case may be, or somebody raised a warning flag. You can have those conversations to address a specific academic issue. And then as other things are uncovered, you can address those as well. But but definitely, that's just, you know, I know it's very simplistic, but there's so many resources on campus. Not using them and then looking back at the end of the semester, uh, you know, why a student left and they never took advantage of the resources, it's just, it's really disheartening. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that is, it's great to hear your words of wisdom. Um, and we have what we call a lightning round now for questions, where we like to get to know Dr. Ellis as a former college student. So are you ready? Right. Okay. As a former so, co as a former college student. Okay. I'm going to think <laughs> back a few years ago. So, uh, so thinking about your college experience. Okay. So tell us about your freshman year. What did life life look like for Dr. Ellis when he was a freshman? Gosh, that was that was many years ago. I can can barely remember what I had for lunch two hours ago. Much less than twenty years ago. <laughs> But try, trying to think back, um, you know, I, I do remember, you remember the weirdest things. And, and I remember, you know, I, I still tell students this story. If I could take a class over, I took an introduction to my major class and I made a C. And it was just because I was lazy. I thought I was a piece of cake. I don't got to put in much effort. I can just show up most of the time, not do all the work, but do most of it. Eh, it's optional. That class should have been an easy A, and an 18-year-old Kyle just didn't take it as serious as he should. And so, you know, I had very few bad grades in college, but, but that class there is one that I'm still kicking myself in the pants for here many years later that had no, no reason doing, doing poor in the introduction to my major. But, um, but just thinking about it, you know, at, at least for me, I was very social, and so I, I think that was, you know, uh, an advantage I had. Um, I didn't know many people at all whenever I went to college. But within the first week, I had lots of friends. Uh, I was outgoing. I tried new things. So I was never bothered by, you know, the social aspect of being hours away from home. That was all good. Academics, I could do it. But I was, you know, 18-year-old male who was just a little lazy, you know. I had my whole life structured, you know, playing basketball and, and doing well in, in high school. And everything was just so organized. Going to college, I had this newfound freedom that, you know, yeah, if I want to sleep in a little late. Yeah, if I want to stay up and eat. Papa John's at one o'clock in the morning. You know, nobody <laughs> told me not to. And so, uh, so thinking about those, just, you know, life lessons, 
you know, I still did, did you know, well enough academically, and I said socially was fine and stuff. So, yeah, I, I had a great experience. I mean, some things I could do over, sure, but I think it ultimately made me, you know, the person I am today. Um, you know, and, and I kind of hit on this before, but but the biggest part was just, you know, for my career trajectory from, you know, 18-year-old freshman thinking he wanted to major in, you know, athletic training and getting that hands-on experience. Even freshman year, I knew, that, okay, this is not what I want to do with the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. And so taking advantage of that and then speaking to advisors and instructors on, on campus and uh, figuring out kind of my calling was uh, was definitely something that I was proud that I did beginning freshman year. Yeah, Absolutely. And you talked about resources that you tell your students. What's one resource you wish you would have used more of in college? Oh, one resource I wish I would use more in college. You know, I guess... I, I really, once I kind of found my home within my major, mm-hmm. I still had to take the general education classes. Right. And I really didn't, you know, like most students, why am I in music? Why do I have to take history? And you know, I still did well in the class. I did fine. But I didn't go visit those professors' office hours. I didn't go to free tutoring in those subjects. Mm-hmm. I didn't take advantage of any of those resources where, you know, maybe if I had, I could have got an A instead of a B, you know. And, and if it was... One thing I did value tremendously was, you know, the instructors, the professors that were in my major. I mean, I felt like they were my mom, dad, aunts, uncles. I would go prop up in their office. Hey, I was, you know, I just had a great rapport. And I guess one thing that helped, you know, helped me persist is we know connections are so important in, 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 in persistence. And they really helped me get connected not only to my major, but to the university. Um, but thinking back to, to my undergraduate career, those gen ed classes, mm-hmm. I just kind of like what some of our students think now. I just, you know jumped through the hoops. I took them and, and, and don't get me wrong. It gave me a foundation. I appreciate that now, but I was like probably most 18, 19 year old students. You know, why do I have to take these general education courses when I want to go into a major that you know, I'm not going to use this stuff. And you know, that, that was me being silly because thinking back, I, I do use it and it did create a good foundation. Um, but, but yeah, there's just things outside of my major. I wish I would have, would have taken advantage of those resources. Well, and it's, I just think this is so interesting. I think that's helpful for students to think about, too. Where do we come from? What are our experiences like? Because now that we have our master's degrees, our PhDs, you know, we've got fancy titles and stuff. Like, what, what is it that makes us human? Because a lot of our probation students, especially, I think, look at us as like, okay, here's a smooth trajectory, and they never got anything lower than an A-plus in their classes. And um, I know I've definitely earned non-As in some of my classes. Um, and those have been some of the most helpful experiences. I don't know, just thinking back to college and who are people, because now you're so influential to so many students. And what, what are some people that, I guess, if you're thinking back to someone who really you thought was inspirational, did you have a favorite professor? And, and what was that person like? Um, you know, I don't know if I had a favorite professor. Um, because I like so many people. I said the department, you know, Health and Human Performance Department at UT Martin Awesome. like that one professor like ooh, I hope somebody else teaches that because I don't want to take him or her uh, I like them all I got along with everybody uh, it worked really well um, thinking about my my PhD at Ole Miss all the professors in the higher ed program were wonderful uh, and, and so those classes were not you know any, any difference um, but back to to just my undergrad experience and if, if our students are, are hearing this now you know I was under a faculty advisor model a model and so we had faculty performing the academic advising. And as I changed majors, I changed advisors. And then finally I got to my, 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 my you know, K-12 health and human performance education major. And um, I was assigned an advisor, uh, Lucia Jones. I still remember her because she's a super nice lady and taught some of the classes. And what probably a common mistake that, that many of our students make now, I fell victim to. You know, how sometimes students listen to other students for information instead of, you know, the actual professional on campus. Mm -hmm. Well, at that time, uh, I I was close to graduation. It was probably the semester before I was a student teach and uh, the university had changed catalogs. And so you had the option. If you'd been there before, you could start on the new catalog or you could stay on your current catalog. 
And I was in a class that, uh, I, I want to say, I think it meant early. I just didn't want to go early. Now, I ended up through another fellow friend and the major said, oh, no, you know, on the new curriculum, you can take so-and-so to replace that. I'm like, okay, cool. And so I, I dropped the early class, and I picked up the other one, and I started going, and everything was great. And then uh, my advisor, and this is a couple weeks into the semester, and, and my advisor, Lucia Jones, reached out, and she said, Kyle, why are you taking this class? It, you, you don't need it. And I said, oh, no, so-and-so told me the new catalog, and it counts. And she said, well, if you do that on the new catalog, you got to take all these other classes on the new catalog. And so I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> you're, you're not going to be able to student teach in the spring and graduate. And so, of course, then I turned as white as a ghost and panic set in. Yeah. And she said, she said, you know, well, let me see what I can do. See if we can get you back in the other one or we can do a substitution. And um, and then, so I, you know, probably didn't sleep that night nervous. Like, oh, no, there's my future now, you know. And so I went back to her office the next day. And she said, I don't know if she said, you know, I was up all night tossing and turning because I was worried about you. She told me that. And then when she got to her office that morning, the chair approved whatever needed to be approved and it was resolved and I was fine. I was going to be okay. And so, you know, I actually went, I remember, I actually went to, to Kroger, bought her a card and a balloon that said, thank you. Thank you for everything you did. I'm sorry I made you worry through the night because I made a bad decision following another student's advice to check in directly with you. And I just, you know, that, I still, that, you know, years ago, I still think about that now, that an advisor worried about me all through the night because I may not graduate because I made the mistake. And so that's, uh, you know, somebody that really still stands out to me you know, many, many years later. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's really cool. Yeah. That's really so cool. we're about to wrap it up here on the chit chat for episode two. So we thank you, Dr. <laughs> Atlas, for joining us. But one last question. What last bit of advice do you have for anyone at the University of Mississippi? It's so hard to pick one piece of advice. You know, I, I beat the user resources drum. You know, I guess I'll change it up a little bit to say, you know, get involved. Like I tell the graduate, like I tell the graduate students, you know, this can apply to freshmen though. Get involved, meet as many people as possible, gain as many experiences as possible. You're only in that, you know, for the most of our freshmen are very traditional campus. Most of our freshmen, 18, you know, 19 years old and then through undergraduate years, 22, 23, you only have that window one time in your life. So enjoy it. Have fun. Be social. Meet people. Take academics first, of course. Put academics first, of course. But take advantages of all the, the unique things that you'll, you'll you know, be able to, to see and experience and accomplish you know, while you're at the University of Mississippi. And so don't take that for granted because it does go by really fast. You know, tell the freshman that it's going to go by really fast, and then you look at the, the calendar and their first semester is already over. Mm -hmm. And then you're thinking about maybe one day I'll see them as graduate students again. But for the most part, that was that short time window I had. And so hopefully it took advantage of that and, you know, met many people and expanded that network and gained all those new experiences. And, uh, you know, so use your resources, yes, uh, but take advantage of all the wonderful opportunities and meet as many people as you can. You only get this once. Yeah. Well, he said it, y'all. Take advantage of everything you can while you are in college, especially here at the University of Mississippi. We've got tons of resources that are on our website. If you contact us to have academic consultations or student success coaching, we can go through numerous resources with you. Um, but we want to thank Dr. Ellis for his time this afternoon and making part of episode two for us of the Chit Chat. And we will have a link to the Amazon for the book. And if anybody wants to get an autographed copy, we'll have your email address down there. They can contact you and continue this conversation further. But other than that, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for having me, guys. Look forward to watching other episodes in the future. Sounds great. Thanks so much. Bye.